Okay, hi everyone. So good morning and welcome to the 4D World Tour Live 2021. So I'm Eric Tessandier and I'm the CEO of 4D Group. So uh, it's my great pleasure to meet with you today in this virtual environment. So we hope you and your loved one are well and in a good health. Uh, of course, we would have preferred to see you all in person as we have done for all the previous World Tour. Unfortunately, the pandemic is still a major concern and we decided many months ago to avoid unnecessary risk and make this a digital event. However, our technical teams are more motivated than ever to present the amazing new features that are in our latest uh, release of 4D V19. And today we will share several practical examples showing you how to use these new features. So if you have attended a previous world tour, you know that the first day includes a brief business presentation followed by a technical session uh, showing examples of some of the new features and evolution offered in the 4D programming language. And the second day was an advanced training expanding on the examples shown in the first day. The first day was free and the second day was a paid training. And for this world tour live event, we have kept a similar format, but day one is two hours, and this is today. And for the advanced training session, we have created nine hours of comprehensive training, and we will go in detail later in this presentation. And as you all know, uh, the pandemic hit hard in March 2020, forcing 4D to cancel our planned summits in Paris and Chicago. But with a lot of work, and hard work of the part of the 4D community, including our sponsors and developers. So we transformed this in-person event into a digital success with thousands of viewing on YouTube. And you can still access of these summit sessions for free on YouTube. And you will find that uh, they are still relevant to the evolution of your 4D application. And uh, before we begin with the technical session, so I let Yolan Rodriguez, our international sales business manager, review some important business and product information that took place in 2020. So you're in, it's you. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, everyone. During the pandemic, many sectors of the economy suffered, such as tourism, retail, event management, restaurants, and the airline industry. These industries were hit hard and affected their businesses. Fortunately, for the most part, the software industry avoided this downturn. And overall, 4D held up very well. Despite the cancellation of both summits in Chicago and Paris and the refund of $400,000, we still had revenue equal to that of 2019, which was at that time a very good year for 4D. And just as important, we continue to invest 30% in research and development. Strong recurring revenue of 78% allowed us to continue to make large investments in our product and services. Revenue that is diversified on a regional basis and across many different industries protected us from uh, the pandemic during uh, the global pandemic protected us. Once again, 2020 proved that 4D has built a strong business model, which secures your investment in time and money, even during difficult times. 4D has now been profitable in each of the past 25 years with professional services now accounting for more than 10% of our revenue stream. That figure was 7.4% in 2019, and we'll be over 13% in 2021. So thank you all for developing powerful and sustainable applications that withstand the test of time. This is our motivation to continue investing heavily in our products and services. To give you an idea of the work completed in 2020, the product and engineering teams produced eight major releases, four long-term and support versions, and four feature releases. In one year, from V18R2 
to V18R5, 18 new features were specified, developed, tested, and delivered. More than 95 blog posts were made to describe the use of these new features. How do eyes, components, and full applications were added to the repository on Git? Videos, tweets, and email were generated every week to keep you up to date with news about your 4D platform. In 2021, we are right on schedule again with the release of V18R6 in April and the release of V19 long-term support in July. Many customers have already upgraded their current applications to V19, and I'm sure you'll be the next one after this presentation. In keeping with, your pro with our promise at the 2020 Summit Digital Experience, we're offering more training options than ever before. And this has been a big boost to the early adoption of the new versions of 4D. Since the launch in 2020, we've set up 10 different topics and sold more than 800 registrations to these training sessions that include 120 people attending our beginner training also. So if you need to hire a new developer, be assured that he or she can be trained quickly and easily with a combination of your long-term expertise and 4D online training programs. And your next training opportunity is here now. We encourage you to subscribe to the World Tour Live package of nine full hours of training that you can schedule as you wish between beginning in October and December at the cost of 299 euros or 2,990 um, kronor uh, for 40 partners. You will find the link to the subscription page in the chat window, uh, either at the bottom or the side of the screen. Now, before we head to the technical portion of today's presentation, I'd like to provide a brief update on our professional services business unit. This revenue stream is growing significantly every year. A 35% increase only in 2020 versus 2019 and expectations of the same increase in 2021. Since the inception of professional services, we've delivered 310 projects to customers around the world helping them maintain or evolve their applications. In 2020 alone, we delivered 74 projects. Today, the professional services co team consists of more than 50 professionals with many different skills, including both back-end and front-end developers who are expert in 4D, of course, JavaScript, Swift, Angular, GraphQL, React JS, Node JS, and many more development environments. We also offer code audits, migration, development resources for your team, user interface design, and much more. Over the years, this work has been done both on site and remotely. However, in 2020, 100% of the project were successfully completed remotely. In summary, if you have a project but you need assistance to complete it, we can support you. Contact us for a customized personal proposal using proven 4D resources that fit your needs. That concludes the business portion of today's event. Thank you for your attention. Now on to the incredible technical sessions that you've been all waiting for. I hope you enjoy what you're about to see. And I hand on, now I hand on the microphone to Basma and Alham, our 4D experts. I'll see you later. Thank you, Yolen. Hello, everyone. During this technical presentation of the World Tour 2021, we will start with a V18 binary mode application. It will be converted to project mode and finally be converted to V19.
over the course of the presentation, we will focus on these five, five major themes. We will discuss each one of them in details through a set of features. Okay, now let's start by introducing and giving a general overview of the application that will be used for this work tour. Here is the demonstration video. For the entire world tour, we will be using a single application to highlight the many features possible with 4D. First, we will start with the application in V18 in binary mode, then we will convert the application to project mode, and then upgrade the application to V19. So let's get started. First, we open the application in 18R6. Now, this application is to organize appointments for medical and wellness medical houses, combining the activities of doctors and coaches. The application has four main parts. First, the customers, which are the patients. Then health, which is for doctors, which gives a listing of doctors, appointments, and consultation types. And next is wellness, which proposes coaches, wellness centers, and activities. There is also an administration panel, which we will discuss later. But let's start the demo by looking at the customers. We click on the customers and we see a form. On this form, on the left, there are the, there's a list of patients and on the right is the information of the specific patient selected. This is the general flow of the data in the application. As this is a list, we can search and sort. For example, by searching John. If we look down at the bottom of the form at the visualization button, visualization is a classic mode of data access, which is often abbreviated as CRUD, read, update, and delete. Some of the choices are not available since no record is currently selected. Next, let's select a customer and discover the information panel. Now let's change the data access to modification and the fields are now enterable. And the fields are formatted based on the location which was seen in a previous world tour. Now if we change the country to France, the state, the idea of the state goes away. But for, the, for this demo, let's stick to the US. Now, if you look at the vertical bar, we see a set of icons. The second icon gives the appointments for this customer since 2018. The blue lines in the list are medical appointments and the green are for wellness activities. Now this is the list of the appointments taken in the past, but to set an appointment, we need to go to the health toolbar. Clicking on the doctor, we have a list of doctors. And concurrently, we can also look at the consultation types like this, or the medical houses like that. Now we can have all of these active windows at the same time, which is very common in a 40 application, but let's go back to the doctor. So if we click on a doctor, we see the list of consultation types that the doctor performs. This doctor is a diet dietitian that also performs vaccines, vaccinations. And the doctor works on Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, so they're off on Tuesday. So this doctor works on Monday, but when? Clicking on the row, we get the information that this doctor works from 9 a.m. to noon and 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. As to the default period for this doctor, but in the training, we will see that we can have several periods for a doctor and a, for a consultation type in a specific medical house. Now, now we know about this doctor, let's look at their appointment information. Now, let's remember that this doctor does not work on Tuesday. And we can see that in the planning. And the planning is color coded, each day is color coded from the busiest day, a completely full day, a black, which is in black, to the lightest day, which is in blue. Now, let's look at August 5th. As we can see, it's yellow, so there's, there are a few spots. And the planning above, and the ruler above, shows that there are a few spots in the afternoon, right there. If we click on an appointment, we can have a look at all the details of the appointment. Now, this appointment was scheduled in July. The patient arrived six minutes before. 
the appointment started 15 minutes late, the appointment lasted five minutes, and the medical assistant closed this appointment one minute after the original scheduled time. Now let's finish the presentation with a demonstration of the appointment wizard. First we select the consultation type, which is internal medicine. Then we select the medical house, which is Rome Medical Center. And we see that Dr. Julong is proposed, so we'll choose that. Next, we select the patient, John Benavides. And we want an appointment for September 1st for a duration of 30 minutes. But as we can see here in the list, the first appointment is on the second, as the first is not available. So next, we click on the appointment and we click accept to accept the appointment. Now this is a great use case for client server mode for, the, for when the medical assistant is taking an appointment for someone on the phone or someone is at, in front of them at their desk. And later on in the world tour, we will show how a patient can do this, can book their appointment over the web and via an iPhone application. In this video, we will highlight some important technical points about this application. First, the structure. The structure is centered around the medical house table. And on the top, we have all the tables necessary for the health portion of the application. On the bottom, the wellness portions tables. And on the right, the tables for the individuals and groups of individuals. All of the links are named. This is mandatory for Orda. And here is my naming convention. The name of the many to one is in lower camel case with the name of the target table. For the one to many link, the name is also in lower camel case with the name of the start table in plural. Now, word of the wise, a good naming convention will help immensely when using Orda. Now, let's look at a method. This method is dedicated to displaying lists of items. And as you can see, all of the code in this method is in Orda. There is not a single line of legacy code in the entire application, unless we're absolutely necessary. And we will use objects with both bracket and dot notation. In fact, we will use objects almost everywhere in this application. For example, looking at the toolbar, the toolbar is defined using JSON. And in order to display this list in customers, we have a definition for a customer entry. And we can have a look at here at the JSON file that defines the customer entry list. The data is the customer, we have the XLIF associated, we have the label, we have the icon, we have the data class, we have the fields upon which you can search in a search bar, we have the validation rules, we have the list box columns that are displayed, we have the order by information, and we have the counter. Now all of this information is modifiable and we have the rendering of this JSON file in 4D thanks to the code. To load the JSON definition file, we have a new method. This method uses the new file in folder commands in 4D. <clears throat> we use JSON parse to transform the text in the JSON file. Then we use JSON resolve pointer to group all of the definitions present in the folder containing the JSON file. Here they are in one single file. We will study this in depth in the training. Next, looking down the code, we see that we use storage to store the information in a shared object. We use the shared object and storage here in order to avoid unnecessary process or interprocess variables. Now, of course, we have a lot of local variables as seen above. But the goal here is to reduce the process and interprocess variables to the bare minimum. 
Now let's see how many process or interprocess variables we use in our application. We can check this thanks to the compiler. With the compiler, we have the option to generate a symbol file after the compilation. Now switching to the finder, I have a new symbol file next to my application that was generated. Now if we open the file and have a look, we see that this application does not use any process or interprocess variables. Now this is not always possible to do, but we challenged ourselves to have no process or interprocess variables and we succeeded. Opening the Runtime Explorer, we have all of the running processes and one main process that is used by the framework to display the toolbar. This is process number three. Now, if we change the toolbar module and go to health, for example, we can open up the doctor's consultation type or medical house form. And as we see, we have opened up these forms without the creation of a new process. That means that all of these windows use the same main process as you can see here. Now, this is very important, especially for apps that have a huge number of clients. These days, it is very common for a 4D server to have more than 100 simultaneously connected clients. Now, some people even have 500, 800, 1,000, or even sometimes more than 1,500 simultaneously connected clients to a single 4D server. Now, why is this important? Well, when we reduce the number of processes running on the client, we automatically reduce the number of processes running on the server. And I invite you to discover how this is possible by reviewing the implementation in the application. Now, let's look at the information form for a doctor. All the information on the right panel is from a subform. To see how this panel works, we can look at the panel definition in the project forms. And as you can see, the calendar on the panel is the same as on the form. Now, looking at the information above, civility, first name, last name, all of that is in English. But we're in a world tour, so it's necessary to have a way to translate the application. We do this using XLIF. Now let's change the language to French and see that the form automatically changes to French. Of course, we have other languages that are available. Now, I'd like to point out that we made this application using a framework. This framework was especially created for this world tour. Now, all of the methods of this framework are prefixed with SFW. As you see there. SFW stands for Simple Framework. And simple in the name means that the framework is simple to use. And I invite you to have a look at the framework methods as they can help demonstrate modern best practices in 4D. From our first demonstration, you will notice that the application was built to reflect our real world scenario and to handle a substantial data set. At the end of the, this presentation, access to the source of the application will be made available to all attendees. We hope it will be an inspiration for your future development projects. Okay, now it's time to convert the application to project mode. Remember, project mode is the preferred mode starting in V19. With project mode, your application will gain many benefits in both developments and deployments. Here is a video demonstration. This is the main binary folder of our application. Let's duplicate it and just keep in mind that before converting your database, it's more recommended to keep a clean version if needed. Okay, so copy for converting database to projects. 
Okay, so uh, using the same uh, 4D version of the 18R6, let's open our application. And yeah, uh, let's start immediately by converting our database to projects by going to File, Export, and then Structure to Projects. So this dialog box is displayed, but we won't open the, the projects because some blocking errors are encountered. So let's reveal the log and then open it. Here we have two messages with the attribute severity error. The, fir the first one is on the panel group and then on the toolbar. So uh, they are related to the tile objects and the background offsets. So to get more details about uh, these issues, let's back to the database. Okay. And go into the projects form, starting by the panel group. Okay, as we, we can notice here, we have a dial object. Okay, but it's crystal clear that the dial type is no longer supported by a project after conversion. It's getting a bit dated, so this is not a big matter as long as 4D provides for us the several types of indicators. So let's switch into a thermometer and then let's hide the levels and place it correctly. Okay well fixed then let's go to the toolbar and as you notice here we have a mini button and uh, which has the type 3d button with the style background offset okay nowadays it's not uh, any more useful to fake that the button is pressed in so simply we can change the style to biffle or maybe just none choice Okay, so uh, before exporting our database, let me show you just this invisible button here in the global search, and uh, we will come back to it shortly. So now let's re-export our database to projects. Okay, so let's replace our file and then the conversion successful. Let's reveal the log once again and open the new one. Okay, so when the conversion is done successfully, so here the success is true, not like the first log, which was false. Okay, so now the only thing to do is to open our project. Let's go to the file, open local projects. And we have here a folder named projects, which is created next to your .4db file. And let's open it and open our project. Okay, the data file, we have one, but it was not moved after the conversion. So simply it must be uh, fetched. And let's go to find it. And yeah. One of the good practices, of course, is to make sure that the project is working properly after the conversion. So starting by the button here in the corner, which works uh, properly and redirects, uh, redirects us to the structure. Okay, then let's go to the wellness vision and choosing the groups. And yes, the thermometer displays the right information. However, if you feel pretty nostalgic about the dials, it's possible using SVG. Now let's go back to the project form and choosing the toolbar. Okay, so here for the types of buttons, uh, there is no 3D or invisible button types. So how do we get the hidden button that works well? Yeah, it works well. So let's see its property. We have here button, uh, which has the style regular, but in the display list, we have not rendered the property that's well checked. Yeah, that means that 4D provides a, sig a significant conversion effort. Okay, so returning to the first generated log file. And uh, yeah. In general, messages uh, are classified into three categories based on the severity property. Info describes a certain indication that's not really has an impact on the application interface or features. Warning describes a necessary action should be executed by the converter. And uh, finally, the error as uh, our case uh, describes an issue that requires your intervention to be corrected. It can prevent the database from running properly. Okay, once now a 4D database uh, has been exported uh, as a project, both versions becomes independent of each other. In this case, let's clean up the main folder. Okay, so first of all, we start with the .4db and its index. Let's remove them. 
and uh, we can move our data file and all the related files into the new folder generated automatically after the conversion which called data okay when done so after setting things right we can look at the project folder and more specifically at the sources here we have all the essential elements of uh, our structure that are stored as plain text files so let's go to the forms folder and as you can see here we have uh, each form becomes uh, a folder with more specifically two files the first one is with the uh, for, .4d uh, form extensions so here uh, it's a json description of your form and then we have uh, simply the form method contents okay so the same thing here we have for the methods for the table forms and triggers database methods and finally we have here uh, the whole catalog which presents the xml structure of your database so here we are we have just converted our binary database to projects which opens a new era of collaboration to access all the new 4d functionalities and version control system side so we are going to discover more in a short while. In this presentation, we choose the path of conversion a binary mode application to projects mode. Then it is converted from V18 to V19 as the final step. However, you may prefer a different conversion path you may decide to start by converting to V19, then to projects mode. The choice is in, the, in the final is yours, of course. Now, one of the main benefits of moving to the projects mode is the ability to use source control for your application. Our next video demonstrates, demonstration will show you how easy it is to, to integrate a source control system like Git to manage a 4D project. As you've seen in previous segments, switching to project mode allows allows you to transform your entire database application into a set of text files. And as a direct result of this, we can now use tools for source code management, allowing us to better monitor and control the development of our applications. In this demo, we will show you how you can make use of a source code management system. We chose Git. To get started, go to the official Git website and download and install the package. We will also use source tree as a graphical user interface to manipulate our Git repositories. To get started, we need to create a new local repository or repo on our database folder. This local repo, which is basically a new folder that Git creates on our database path, .git. For the sake of this demo, we will not make any modifications to this folder. Just know that this is where the magic happens. Now, looking at source tree, we open up our database folder and we notice that there's a question mark icon next to each file. This means that Git is not currently tracking any modification on any of these files at the moment. And in order for Git to start tracking the files, we need to select the files to track in this interface. For example, we will only track the necessary files for our database to work, project sources, forms and methods and our resources folder. You may need to track other files on your database project. Once this is done, we can take a first snapshot of our database. This is called a commit. In order to make a commit, we need to link it to a commit message. And for this example, we'll use first commit as the commit message. So now that we've done our first commit, we've committed this into our local repo. And going back to our project history, we can see that we have made a first commit here today. And in this first commit, we can see that we have all the files and folders that we previously selected on the file list interface. So now let's switch to 4D and start making modifications on our database application. In fact, 
we need to add some code to the method appointment find slots. So we do the modification. And then we go back to source tree. And here we, here we see that Git has identified that the method appointment find slots has been modified. And now, if we are happy with the changes, we can do a second snapshot or commit. And now we can put in a comment and click commit. So from here, we can review again the history of the commits. As you see here, we have the second commit. And looking down lower, we have, we're able to see the files that were changed in the second commit appointment find slots. And to the right, we see the exact changes that were done in this method. So now, say for example, we did not want to commit that second commit. And we want to revert back to the first commit. To do this, we only need to reverse the commit that we just made. This will then create a third commit with the commit text revert second commit. This third commit will in effect roll back any modification that had been done in the second commit and take the code to the first commit stage. This allows us to keep a history of all work that has been done on the project. Now Git offers a wide variety of ways to roll back changes, like going back to a particular commit and checking the difference, or the deletion of a commit, or just reverting back to a particular commit from the past. And going back to 4D, we see that the code is no longer committed, and we indeed went back to the original state. Now up to this point, we've only been working with Git locally. That means that we have only been making changes and committing to our local repo. But in order to collaborate with other people, we need to be able to share our source code and modifications with everyone on the project. In order to do this, we need to work with a remote repository. A remote repo is a Git repository that is located on the network or through some third-party application like GitHub or GitLab. Now, let's see a remote repo in action. This example will use GitHub. From my side, I've already created my account at GitHub and created my new blank remote repository. We can commit to remote repositories in GitHub through HTTPS or SSH. For this example, we will use HTTPS. I have also configured source tree to have a new remote connection to my remote repository. See, there it is. The next thing I need to do is copy my local repository into the remote repository. This puts all of the code that I have in my local repo onto my remote repo, so my teammates can start to collaborate. The remote repo will be the place that all other teammates will push their code as well. So in order to do this in source tree, I simply click on the push button. I push to master. Now we can see from our history in source tree, my commit is also on my remote repository. And if we refresh the GitHub page, we see that we have the entire project there as well. Now, let's see how another developer can start working on this project. I've switched to another session on my computer to show this. I've created a new empty folder with the name of my database application. And in this folder, I have also created a new local repo. On source tree, I have also configured the remote connection with the remote repo in GitHub. And in order to get the code and start working, I need to clone the database application from my remote repo. I do this 
by clicking the pull button and pulling from the remote repo. Now, I not only have the latest source code of the project, but the entire commit history from the other developers. Now, if we look at the finder, we see that we have all the files that we need to start working on our project. So let's open up this project in 4D. As we see here, we have everything we need to start working. We have our methods, we have our forms, we have it all. So now I can start making modifications on my side. Say for example, creating a new feature in my application. Now, as I make progress on the feature, I can commit the code to my local repo to save it locally. And when I'd like to publish it for my teammates, I can then push it to the remote repo so that they can pull the changes and continue to work on the project. In this video, I showed you a real life scenario of how you and your team can get started with Git in 4D. Now, if you'd like to learn more, we will also have a dedicated session for Git in 4D, where we will look at the powerful features offered by Git and discuss how we can leverage them to improve your 4D development. Source control usage promotes collaborative developments. It offers a modern and efficient way to manage a development project. A feature such, such as merge, rollback, and conflict resolutions are huge benefits that a binary mode application development is enabled to offer. So all of these gains are the result of project mode conversion. There are many more benefits from developing in project mode, including classes. Now, it's time to upgrade our application to V19 and enjoy the benefits that project mode and V19 have to offer. Let's take a look at our next video demonstration. In this demo, we have the application open up in V19, and we're in project mode. And here we have a dashboard of all the appointments for all doctors at all medical houses for a given year. Now, if we want to have a look into that form, we can edit the form and see that in the corner, we have a pop-up menu. Now, this pop-up menu doesn't have a variable because we use a dynamic variable and its expression type is array-based. And now in V19, we are able to use an expression like form.popup here, and we can define the expression type to be of type object. Now we can open the form method and comment out the old code that was used to manage the pop-up menu based on a dynamic variable. And now we want to use an object. So we, do, we can define an object, and after we can define a collection to show, store the values of the object. And to fill this object, we need to define the current year and loop from three years before to 10 years after the current year. So in this loop, we push the year into the collection. Then we need to define the index and we set it to be three because we'd like to set the index to the current year. Now let's go back to the form and look into the object method. The object method calls a method to calculate the dashboard. The first line has a pointer to the, to the dynamic variable for the pop-up menu. We can comment this out. We can also comment out these three lines that were there just to read the value of the pop-up menu. Now, to read the value, we just need to read the value of the object at, at its index. And now, 
Let's refresh the form and see that we have the exact same functionality for the end user, but for the developer, the code has become much simpler. Now let's switch gears and go to the customer module. If we click on a customer, you see in the right panel, all of their medical appointments since 2018. And two of the columns in this list box are time and duration. These two columns are times, but behind the scenes, they're actually text values formatted to display time. Now, if we go to the subform that defines this panel, we see that we have two columns that are in fact text. Now, let's change these for, for time values. And we also want to show only hours and minutes. Now let's do the same for the other column. Now let's look at the form method and look at the calculation method for this list box. In fact, what we're doing is we are manipulating timestamps, stringifying them, and saving them in the correct format for display. But now we can just manipulate the time values themselves, removing the extra steps. And now if we reopen the form, the values look the same, but they are now real time values behind the scenes. So now that we are working with time values, we can use the values to make calculations by simply displaying the footer. In the duration column, we can set the variable calculation to sum and display it as a time with the format of our choosing. Now let's see how this looks in the form. And you can see that this person has spent 14 hours and 15 minutes at the doctor over the past four years. Let's have a look at another major feature in 40v19, the Data Explorer. Now we launched the Data Explorer, but in order to do this, we need to make sure the web admin server has been launched. Now we can display all the information in our database, for example, the country. See, we have the UUID, the address format, the flag, and we're even able to hide information or not by clicking there. Now let's have a look at the coach table. See, we are able to easily search in our data thanks to the built-in search boxes above. Now this is a very easy way to look at your data without having to write a single line of code. The transition to V19 is almost transparent for applications that were already in V18. In the previous demonstration, we highlighted new ways to replace the use of array variables with objects and collections. Inform widgets such as a pop-up drop-down list and list box. But there is one essential point that we want to mention. 4D V19 allows the native compilation on the new Apple M1 processor architecture. It was a huge accomplishment by our engineering team. Several developers have already gotten back to us with positive feedbacks, including huge performance gains. Here is a blog post from one of our major customers, an early adopter who discovered impressive results from his V19 benchmarks on the Apple M1 processor. Check the, the chat box to find the link. Now, 4D V19 has several enhancements done to the web feature as well. Our next demonstration will show how we can use web features to extend our wellness application in a wider audience on the web using modern web features in V19. Let's have a look. In this demo, we will focus on the web part of our solution that allows for the management of medical houses and wellness centers. We will see together the appointment process that a user would be able to follow to book an appointment with a doctor, a coach, or a medical practitioner. So let's get started 
by entering the web address in the browser's search bar. The 40 web server redirects us to the home page. Here we see some information such as the services available to the user from the system. There are also two search areas above that allow for the searching by doctor, by specialty, or by address. For example, if I'd like to make a, an appointment with a physiotherapist, I just need to type it in the search box. The application then shows the user the available physiotherapists. I choose David Clare. This drop-down shows the consultation type available by this physiotherapist. I choose physiotherapy. Then a second drop-down appears for the medical house, and I choose the medical house, Crane Creek. Next, I'd like to proceed to make an appointment, so I click the Book an Appointment button. After choosing the practitioner, consultation type, and medical house, the user needs to choose the appointment time from the doctor's available time slots. Here, we see the calendar for August. Notice that there are dots under the 25th and 26th. This means that there are openings on those days. Now, let's choose the 25th. Here, on the right, we see the available time slots on the 25th. So the user is available at 2 p.m. So they click on 2 p.m. and they click Confirm. And next we have the summary of the steps done to get the user to this point. And the user still needs to verify by email in order to complete the appointment. And note that it says sign in in the upper right hand corner. This means that the user is not yet authenticated. After confirming the steps, the user clicks Take an Appointment. The 40 web server redirects the user to the login page in order to authenticate. The user enters their credentials, aliceabadie at gmail.com, and their password, and clicks Login. The user then automatically receives a verification code by email that they now need to enter. Four, six, two, zero, five, and click validate. And now we see that the appointment was successfully created for Alice Abadie at Crane Creek with David Clare at 2 p.m. on 825. This application contains many other features that we will see in future demos and during training sessions for the world tour. Now we will have an overview of the technical features of this application. We saw in the previous demo how a user can make an appointment with a doctor, a coach, or a wellness instructor. When a user navigates the web app, requests are sent from the browser to the 40 web server. These requests are intercepted by the database method on web authentication, which is the entry point of the web server. In this method, we instantiate the dollar sign request handler object of type request handler. Request handler is an object that handles all the requests that we made. Then we call the function dispatch from the request handler object, and that will tell 40 what to do based on the request type. We have in the web folder project methods that are entry points to handle user requests. These methods contain a comment line that contains a tag, slash path, and a JSON object with a path attribute whose value here is slash home. This means that if we type in the search bar the application address slash home, it is this method that will be executed. Then we call the render function, which sends the response to the browser. This method is based on the attribute view, which defines which HTML page 40 needs to send to the browser. For example, when the home page method is executed, the index.html is sent to the browser. So now if we put a breakpoint in the method, and refresh the browser, we see that the breakpoint is triggered 
and that the method home page is in fact executed. And the same can be done for any web method. For example, if we put a breakpoint in staff search and we search physio in the application, we see that staff search is called in the debugger. Clicking continue, we have the results on the web page. We have just seen the typical use of the web server in VORD, intercepting requests in the on web authentication method and redirecting the requests to methods to handle the requests. Now we will see and discover a new concept in this demo, the scalable web session. The 4D engine provides a session object that allows access to the session created for each user, and more precisely, for each browser connected to the 4D server. The session object is accessible by all web processes used by this user. The session object contains a storage attribute that allows us to store whatever we want. For example, we use this session object heavily in the staff appointment method. So let's put a breakpoint and trace how it's used. From the web app, we will trigger the breakpoint. In the method, we get the context and create a new shared object appointment inside the shared object session.storage. Since session.storage is a shared object, we have to use use to make sure we access our shared object safely. Here we put the information about the appointment, doctor, consultation type, and location, and then below we put the year and month. By default, we put the current year and the current month. Then we specify the HTML page to send to the browser. So now we have all the necessary information to make an appointment stored in a session object. And when the user inputs their verification code that is sent by email into the application, the method appointment validate is executed. This method calls a function book that is an extension of the class that extends the data class appointment. We will see in a demo how to extend data classes. Next, here we pass the session.appointment object and the user ID of the currently connected user to the function. This function takes the information from the object and stores it in the database. So the idea is that we use the session.storage object to keep information in memory and then commit the information to the database only when needed. This principle is easily implemented thanks to the new session mechanism in 4D. All right. 4D Web Server is scalable in Venice. The new scalable session takes full advantage of multi threading processing. 4D developers will also benefit from a new request handling and a new context management through a new session object. One more feature that's worth mentioning, even though it's not a part of our demonstration, is the new transformation tag called for the each, which works the same way as for the each loop. And uh, an essential complement to for the application, for the for iOS brings an indispensable mobile facet to them. In this demonstration, we will extend the appointment booking features to the iOS devices thanks to for the for iOS. In this segment, we will see how to create a new mobile application. This application will allow users to make an appointment with the doctor. The first step is to create a mobile project and give it a name. Then we will fill the organization's information. We will specify the name of the company, choose the identifier, the name of the product, the version, our logo, edit the copyright, 
and choose the team. The next step is to specify the tables and the fields that we will need to display and use in our application. In this case, we select in the appointment table the field start, STMP, duration, medical staff, consultation kind, and medical house. And in the consultation kind table, we select name and photo. Now we are going to apply a filter to the appointments. A user only needs to see the latest appointment. So after writing the query, we will click on validate to check if it's valid or not. Then we will edit the authentication method. This is a simple method that checks if the user exists and returns information as ID, email, and stamp. After that, we will create an action and name it booking. We choose the icon and the labels. And we're going to apply it on current entity of the consultation con table. We will edit the on mobile app actions by implementing this code. This method is in charge of managing action requests by the mobile application. In this code, we created a dynamic form with a new action by adding parameters in the result and named it valid MH. The next step is choosing icons and labels for our tables and naming them appointment and consultation kind. We will apply formatters on fields like seconds to time on duration. And then we will rename start STMP to date and we will apply another formatter. Let's move on to the main menu to make sure that we display the consultation kind menu before the appointment menu. To display our data, we can use existing templates or download them from GitHub. In our case, for appointment, we will use the four labels template where we will add the fields duration, start STMP, and consultation kind name. And then we will use medical house name as a section. And for searching, we use medical house name, consultation kind name, medical staff last name, and first name. To display appointment data, we will choose the visual contact template and we'll add medical staff photo, consultation's kind name, medical house name, and medical staff last and first name, and then duration and start STMP. And finally, for consultation's kind table, we use a list form called simple table with picture, where we add the name and the photo, and then we use name for search. Before building our application, in publishing, we need to toggle on authentication and make sure that the web server is running. Then in the build tab, we choose the device and then click build and run. After our app is built, we can log in using our email. On the consultations kind menu, we'll use the search bar to look for nurse. And then we can swipe left to book an appointment. We can specify the date and the medical house and then tap next. After that, we can choose the doctor. And finally, we select a time slot for the appointment. Then on the appointment menu, we can look for our reservation by searching for the medical house, for example. Tapping on the appointment brings up a detail page with even more information. Thanks to a set of really advanced and innovative features, 4D for iOS allows you to expand your business application on iOS and tomorrow on Android. Just to name a few, with notifications, you can send notifications to all app users or to a selected group of users, providing a very efficient way of interacting within a company. 
Thanks to deep linking, you can ensure a seamless user experience by bringing users directly to the right place in your application with a single click. Interactions with devices, such as reading barcodes or capturing a fingertip signature directly within the application are fully integrated in 4D for iOS. Last but not least, offline mode. These features is unique on the market. The user will be able to edit and delete records when the server is not available. Once the connection to the 40, to the 40 server is back, these pending tasks are automatically preceded and executed in chronologically relevant order. If you are still not convinced, give it a try. You will surely be impressed with the iOS application that you can build from it. And to help you speed up your learning curve, 4D for iOS in-depth training will be part of the 4D World Tour live training package that will be available in a few weeks. Next, if there is one thing that you must learn in V19, it has to be classes. In this demonstration, we will show you some practical use of classes in an application. Let's have a look. In this demonstration, we will discover how to make a class. First, let's open up the dashboard. In here where we have Hello 40 World, we'd like to put a pie chart of the consultation types. Now, let's open up the panel by clicking on Edit Form. Now, this calls a new command in 4D, Form Edit, which opens up, which opens up the form for editing. Now, let's look at the form method. Here, we have the SVG code to draw Hello 40 World. But instead of this code, we'd like to put the pie chart. Now let's do this by first creating a new class. We will call it pie chart. And to begin a class, we have a keyword called class constructor. A class constructor contains the code that is run whenever a class is initialized. So let's put the attributes needed to make a pie chart inside this class constructor. And we reference all local attributes and functions from this class by the keyword this. Now let's get to writing functions. And we have a new keyword, function. This defines a function. And next we have to give the name of the function, set area size, and then we give the input parameters of a function, height and width. Both of these are integers. And we notice that these parameters are named, so we can directly reference them in the function code. Now this is the same for the function underscore fill shades, which simply defines a collection of colors for the future use in the pie chart slices. Now let's go to the form method to start to use this new class. Let's define an object to be cs.piechart.new. And let's put a breakpoint and inspect the elements in the debugger. Here we have the object graph, and we can see all of the attributes of the object. And if we click show types, we see that the object is of type pie chart, which is a new type in 4D made by me. Now we can define the size of the pie chart with the set area size function, passing in the width and height. And the width and height are from line 25, and we got these from the container size. Now let's move the breakpoint below this and inspect the graph element. And we see that the width and height are no longer set to the default 500 by 500, but are now 834 by 535. Now we need to put data into our pie chart. So we grab the data above with the form.graph series, and we call the class function set series by passing in the data series. But if we remember, our class doesn't currently have a set series function. So let's add it. Now let's draw the graph. 
I will grab some code from an older tech note, adapt it, and put it in a new function called draw graph. And as you can see, this function calls a local function called draw legend, which I'll need to implement as well. Now, let's go back to the form method to use this function. But if we look at the function draw graph, we see that it returns a picture based on this syntax here. So we'll set picked equal graph dot draw graph. And now if we look at the dashboard, we see our pie chart. That pie chart looks great, but is missing a few items, namely the title and subtitle. Now we can add those by setting the attributes of the object manually. We do this by setting graph.title equals form.name and graph.subtitle equals string of the year. Now let's see how this looks. Get rid of the breakpoint. And it looks pretty good, but we're not quite done yet because we need to clean up the code. In fact, we can be even cleverer if we declare the variable graph above, 4D is able to determine what functions and attributes you have for that object when you type graph dot. Here you see you have all of the available functions and attributes. But if we recall, we also had other functions that were prefixed with a, an underscore. And those aren't available in the list, like draw legend or fill shades. Those functions are only visible in the dropdown when you type an underscore. Using an underscore is a clever way to hide functions that you don't want to see when you are using a class, like here in the form method. As already seen in the demonstration, classes promote the organization in programming. They are the cornerstone of object-oriented development. They encapsulate uh, the related functionality into objects, which makes code uh, more, uh, more organized and really easy to maintain. And then extending data classes. Yes, data classes are essential breaks in the order approach, but they are evolving, of course. Here is a demonstration of how and when to extend a data class. In this demonstration, we will continue to explore classes in V19 project mode. We have opened the wizard to book a medical appointment for a consultation type in a specific medical house. Now we select a doctor from a pop-up menu with the full name of all of the available doctors. To do this pop-up menu, we have some code that gets all of the doctors inside an entity selection and loops around them. Then for each doctor in the entity selection, we call the method medical staff underscore get full name. And then we append it to the list. But there's a better way to do this. If we go to the definition of a medical staff entity, it opens up a class called medical staff entity. And this class extends the entities of the data class medical staff. And in this class, let's define a function that will return the full name of the entity. And here is the code to do that simply. Now let's make use of this new function in the object method. Let's get rid of the call to the former project method to get the full name and type the entity dot get, and here we have a predictive list of all associated functions for an entity. 
Let's choose the get full name. And now let's test our code by going back to the wizard to see the difference. In fact, the functionality is almost the same. Now we have the civility, but the code is much simpler to read. Now let's go back to the object method code. This code calls a method that calls a method that uses two project methods to get the date and time from a timestamp. In fact, we can replace these calls to project methods by using the dot day and dot time functions. But why can we do this? Well, entity appointment for the day is a type appointment entity. And in the class appointment entity, we have many functions, two of which are date and time. Now let's go back to the method appointment find slots. We have in the method a query on an entity selection. So we can think of it as a filter. Now this entity selection is of type appointment selection that is an extension of entity selection. So we have a function filter by day that accepts a day as a parameter. And this function does the same calculations as the filter in the appointment finds locks function. Now we'd like to use that function in the appointment find slots method. So let's copy the lines, comment out the code that we're not going to need anymore, and call the filter by day function, passing in the correct day, which is date to study. Now, thanks to this code, we have now extended the capabilities of the entity selection of appointments. So we can extend an entity and an entity selection. Now let's remember from a previous PyCharm demo, if we look at the form, then the form method, we have a function get count by year. And this function is applied directly on a class. So this function extends directly the data class. Now let's go to this function's definition. This function is defined in the consultation kind class that is an extension of the data class. And here we see that this function does a lot of calculations, even querying inside the loop. Let's see how this function in action by putting the keyword trace in the top of the function. Now let's relaunch the calculations by reloading the form. Now we have the debug menu behind our form. Why is that? Well, it is not in the same application. Here we have the debug in 40 server. Yes, that's right. My application for this demo is in client server mode. This trace occurs on the server, which means that this code is launched on the server. Now let's walk through the code. As you see, the form hasn't yet been updated. This is because the form is waiting for the results of the calculation on the server. And if we click play in the debugger, we have directly the results and the pie chart in the form. So the code on the client waits for the code to be executed on the server. Now this is exactly the same as when you check the execute on server attribute for a method, but this is done automatically by 4D. In some cases, this is what we want but in others, we may not want to execute on the code on the server. Now we have ways to avoid unnecessary code execution on server, and we will discover these in the World Tour trainings. The extension of data classes is much more than a simple evolution. It's a real revolution because it's the possibility to enrich all the language with its own functions. But the revolution is only at the beginning, and you will have some nice gems coming in the next releases. The next thing we'll talk about is classes. Now, classes can have a role in every part of applications development. That also includes web development. In this demonstration, we will use classes in the context of 4D REST server.
In this video, we will demonstrate how to use classes in the context of the 40 REST server. You may remember this web page that appears after a user selects the practitioner, the reason for consultation, and medical house. When we choose a date on the calendar, the list of practitioners available slots are displayed on the right. Now, let's take a look at the HTML code for this page. Here we have our first div that displays the practitioner's information. Here we show the practitioner's name, the consultation kind, and also the medical house. Then we have another div here that displays the calendar. Below we have the form tag that displays the time slots. However, this tag is initially empty. We create the form dynamically using JavaScript in the meeting doctor.js file. When we select the date on the calendar, it's the method get available appointments here that is executed. In this method, we call the 40 rest server via the URL slash rest slash appointments slash available appointments with another parameter, which is the date chosen on the calendar. Available appointments is a function of a class that extends the data class appointment. Let's go back to 4D and check out this function. Here we have the available appointments function. It is exposed, meaning that it's visible through a REST call from a web client. Below these few lines of code, here we use the function get available appointments applied to the object itself using the keyword this. This means that the function resides in the same class here. Get available appointments calls the appointment find slots project method to get the available time slots. Now the question is, why do we have two similar functions in this class? The answer is pretty simple. Available appointments is exposed on the web, so we have to control what the web client sends. Remember the golden rule, never trust the user. So here we set controls on the data that is delivered to the 40 REST server. We have the get available appointments function available for internal use. We can use it in other contexts as well, not just on the web. We can use it, for example, in the context of client server apps or in 44 iOS. This allows us to separate the business logic from the interface management. Now let's go back to the parameters that are passed to the available appointments function. Let's start with the second parameter, dollar sign medical capability. This object contains the UIDs of the medical staff, the medical house, and the consultation kind. First parameter is a variant type used here in two cases, when it's text with the date format and when it's a number. This means that this method executes differently according to the value type. So in our case, when we click on the calendar, we send the number corresponding to the day. Then we get the year and the month from the session. Now let's see an example using Postman that calls this function with the date. So here we have the medical capability, which contains the UID of medical staff, medical house, and the consultation. In the first parameter, we also have a date. Then when we send the request to the 40 REST server, we get the response here, which is the collection of time slots available for this particular practitioner. This feature is simple to use, as seen in the demo, and really can help you to increase security. The developer remains in complete control of their development, and only they decide what's, what must be exposed from the rest. Then, classes. The classes allow to extend the business functionalities uh, on the server side with the spirit of the MVC architecture. And now we have the 4D Rights Pro. Yeah, the 4D Rights Pro is an essential tool in the 4D applications. It provides state-of-the-art word processing from within your 4D application. Here we will see a demo that highlights some of the new features. The final user can at the same time from the same interface generate a flyer made of the existing information of the selected coach or instructor from the list and the medical house belonging to it. 
And of course, the flyer theme is programmatically generated depending on the type of activity. The first thing we'll treat is the background image, which is always needed to fill the entire printable area, such as a watermark, for example. And if it wasn't possible in 4D Write Pro, that would be really hard to believe. Now, many options are available for background images, including clipping, repeating pattern, origin, and that is through the new attribute value paper box. To see it more in practice, this is the background image that is set to be repeated in all of our pages. Without any doubt, you've already manipulated inline pictures before. So after inline pictures and background pictures that we've just talked about, 4D gives you even more control over picture insertion at a specific position in a document in front of or behind text, as well as anchored to the page or specific parts of the documents. And that is, of course, by using the wadd picture command. But these images were static, either defined with a picture variable or field or by a picture path. Actually, that is too boring for our interests. So here is something even more thrilling. 4D Rise Pro anchored images now supports 4D expressions. In other words, a valid 4D expression can also be associated to an anchored picture. And that is by simply setting the new image expression attributes. To check that, you can select the second activity, which is dance. And this picture is representing this code here and passed as an image expression. Okay, how about we pass next to the insertion and deletion of rows and columns, which is not only possible, but much more easier to manage through programming thanks to new for commands. It can be achieved by using the interface as well, but it's not our main focus today. In our current case, let's focus more on the columns alone. Like in here, we want to add two columns with certain criteria and positions and manners of how to view them. By passing a certain number of objects containing what and how we want to create our columns to the following method, we get this command which does the task for us as well as returns the range that corresponds to parts created inside the table. As for the rest of the code, we can leave it for later to talk about. Now, such code in the end gives us the following results if we pick the yoga activity. Two columns with different manner on how to be displayed. Following the same logic, to remove rows and columns, there are appropriate commands for that. And the big surprise is that more updates and improvements were done on the wtable get rows, get columns, and get cells commands. They have the same classical usage as before, but this time with more information returned in an object about ranges such as the first row and row count while using the wtable get rows command, which will help us a lot. While we're already talking about tables and rows, let not forget that it's time to talk about the new standard actions that came knocking right at the door, especially for 4D Write Pro, and their main target is tables and their elements. Just to name a few, you can define a tables border, a cells background color, the vertical alignment of text in a row, as well as the alignment of the table itself in the document. Now, the available actions for tables, rows, and cells are numerous and widely open for you to discover and test, but we can show you a few. Like in the second column, we pass the following actions inside the objects, like uh, the border style, the padding top, the width, and the padding to the left, as well as the text alignment. After that, they were executed by the invoke action command. Now, the properties will not be applied to the columns, but to each of their cells. We have treated and discussed various points that lead us to announce that tables are not the only way to display elements. You can also manipulate sections with code, like in the third page here. We have a section divided into two columns, 
the first one displaying the available program like the days when you can join this dance class with this instructor with the time and for how much it lasts with some key points displayed in the second column now we retrieved these informations linked to this instructor and the medical house by using this method here after setting the different layouts and elements you can format the section into two columns like in here moreover you can access any elements or part of a document by programming they're called elements and will be returned either as a single element with the wp get elements by id function or like in our following example as a collection thanks to the get elements function which will return elements of any type paragraphs tables images etc and if a typed range or reference is passed the command will return a collection containing only elements of the corresponding type we wanted to access elements in this section just so we can apply different style sheets on each paragraph yes you've heard me loud and clear style sheets has arrived already to save us a lot of efforts and more opportunities to manage your own stashes for paragraphs like defining the colors, padding, fonts, and much more. The workaround is pretty much easy. You must first create the style sheets with the new command WP new style sheets. Then its contents must be defined using the well known WP sets attributes command, which is not enough new for you. And by that, you can set as many attributes as you want. And last but not least, all you have to do is apply the newly created style sheet to a target. Of course, it's not applied for only paragraphs, but you can also define a style sheet for characters as well by defining their font size or colors, like in this example here. With these two following changes, we get two manners of displaying to these two texts in different colors and size and everything. Now, some of you might be already wondering about the style sheets created with Foggywrite, and I'm here to calm you down that they are not only imported, but they can be applied as well. Another question you might be asking is regarding the real reason of such feature when you can just apply such changes in just one shot. But then again, what would happen if you are supposed to change something afterward? Then, of course, you will have to do it for each paragraph separately. And I quote again, each paragraph separately. Instead, thanks to the new feature about style sheets, you only need to change the attributes in the style sheets itself. And that it. Now that we are more or less satisfied with the outcome, a time for the exposition of the documents. And for the made the exportation of 4D wrapper of documents directly to PDF format, just how we like it. It is now possible and without the need to install any printer drivers or any additional softwares. It can be either exported to a document and saved on your hard drive or to a blob variable that can be sent as an email attachment, for example. You would notice as well a number of options to specify precisely what should be exported and how. Time to test it out and we get our PDF document which contains the flyer that we've been working on. The last thing we'll talk about is one of the concerns we all have or at least lived once. Sometimes you might modify a particular 4D repro document, or maybe, just maybe your cat walked on your keyboard while you're absent and added some stuff you never knew of. So to keep the document protected and non-editable, all you have to do is define which part of the document will be protected or not, and then activate the document protection flag so that the first seasons are taken into account. In our example, we set the whole document as protected so we can change any text or images or any title. As we can see, 
for the repro has suppressed its predecessor for the rights. With V19, we have expanded the we have expanded the features of 4D Repro with the features that you, the developer, asks for, like importation and exportation of Word and PDF documents. Now, 4D View Pro continues to be an amazing productivity tool. In this demo, we will look at how you can create your reports for data-oriented users both simply and effectively. In this demo, let's check out the 40 View Pro tool. Selecting this dashboard icon gives us a list of dashboards. The last three are built with 40 View Pro. Let's start with the first one, Appointments per Medical House. By clicking on the name, the dashboard is displayed on the right. The first three columns show various info about the medical houses in the database. Then we have a number of indicators that have been calculated for the year 2020. The same indicators have been calculated for the year 2021 as well. We can select the desired years from the drop down list above. This last range of columns shows the evolution of these indicators from 2020 to 2021 by Medical House. Here's the form to display the previous dashboard. It contains a 40V Pro area to which we assign this object method. We use the event on VP Ready to call the project method dashboard appointment per Medical House to generate the spreadsheet as soon as the area is ready. We begin here by obtaining the two years to compare. Then we get all the medical houses from the database. We assign to the local variable dollar sign area name, the name of our ViewPro area, in order to use it in the 4D ViewPro commands. Next, we build the collection of values to insert in the dashboard's header with the command VP set values. This collection contains two sub collections because our header is represented on two lines. We add these two sub collections with the push method to our collection dollar sign sales values. We pass it as a parameter in the command VP set values in order to display the header from column zero, row zero. As you can see on the dashboard, these two cells are merged as well as these two cells and also these two. In addition, this range of 10 cells is also merged. That is also the case for this cell and this cell. So in total, we have six ranges of merged cells. In our code, we obtain the six ranges of cells with the command VP cells, which we then merge with the command VP add span. Next, we will set up the style properties of the header. We use the height attribute to change the height of rows, the width attribute to change the width of columns, the word wrap attribute to activate word wrapping and force a line break in the displayed text, and back color attribute to define the background color of the different cell ranges of the header. Now that we're finished with the header, let's dive into the dashboard's contents. Here, we have a for each loop to iterate each medical house. We get the ID, the name, and the address of each medical house, then we calculate the different indicators to be displayed on the dashboard. Afterwards, we add this information to the collection dollar sign current line values corresponding to the current iteration of the loop. Then we add this current collection to the collection dollar sign cells values, which we then pass as parameter to the command VP set values outside the loop. Don't forget the golden rule for 40 view pro optimization. Always use the command VP set values, plural, in a loop. This allows us to do the job in one passing. Now let's move on to the range of columns displaying the evolution of indicators. In our code, we have created a name formula called evolution appointment medical house with the command VP add formula. Then we assign this name formula to all cells pertaining to the evolution with the command VP set formula. This formula allows us to reference the two cells that correspond to each cell in year one and year two and calculate their difference. 
With only two lines of code, we were able to calculate the contents of all cells in the evolution columns. Now, let's move on to formatting cells. We use the formatter attribute with the command VP set cell style in order to add formatting to different cell ranges. We can assign colors to cells according to given conditions. We can also add a suffix to the contents of each cell, such as here with D for day and MM for minutes. We can also format cells as percentages. Finally, we use the command VP column autofit in order to resize column one and column two according to their contents. In conclusion, we have just seen a select few of the many features that 4D View Pro has to offer. In the training session, more features and possibilities will be presented to help you with your 4D View Pro project. As you can see, there are many new features in 4D View Pro to help you build even better spreadsheet, and you can even export these of, uh, to MS Excel to share with others. Also, there are many improvements thanks to the adoption of SpreeGS version 14, upon which 4D View Pro is built. One of the 4D strengths is its comprehensive and intuitive development environment. The team has spent a lot of time making the 4D environment and language even more robust. Let's look at the example of this with the interesting and the useful command in V19, which called Compile Project. In this demo, we will focus on the development mode, especially on the 40 command compile project. This command allows you to compile a 40 project and check the syntax. Now, if I look at the administration module and then launch the compiler, we see that we have 22 errors and one warning. And if we double click on a line in the list box, it opens up the offending method directly so we can modify it and correct the error. Now let's look at the compiler form. We have a subform called compilation underscore syntax check. This subform contains a list box and fields to display the info. In the form method, we use the compile project command to check the syntax and then the project method compile underscore get info to get the data and then we display it on the form. Now if we go to the object method of the list box, we see that we use the 40 command method open path. Now this 40 command takes as parameters the path of the method and the line to which the cursor will be put when the method is opened. Now this tool is interesting, especially when we work in a team. For example, imagine a project manager grabs this source code from the repository, and then they're able to check the syntax directly from the application, and they see that there are a lot of errors. The project manager can then assign to a developer to fix the errors. For example, the project manager knows that a single developer, Raphael, made all of these errors. The project manager can export those lines and send them to Raphael. Raphael is now able to receive the file and import it into the compiler tool. Now, Raphael has the list themselves of all of the issues that they need to address. And if the complication succeeds, we have other elements which are interprocess variables, process variables, local variables, and methods, which we will detail in a training session. We have just emphasized the compile project command. There are many other features that have been added to the development environment that make 4D even more productive. Now, let's have a look at what can be done with the same and aligned framework that our application was made from. This is a demo that we asked an intern student at 4D to do for the world tour. This intern did not have any, any previous 4D knowledge at all. We gave him the framework and asked him to pick the subjects. He picked his favorite sport, Formula One, and decided to make an application for the storage and reporting of all Formula One race data since 1950. 
This is what he came back with two weeks later. In the previous videos, we saw a database application from various angles using a framework that was created for this world tour. And as the application was created with the framework, we can use the same framework to create other applications for free, which is what we're gonna show here. This is the structure of the database. It contains all information from world championships of Formula One since 1950. For example, it stores all lap times for all the pilots over these 71 years. So we have some real data to work with. Now let's see how we can present this data in the new framework. Let's take a look at a driver, for example, double world champion Fernando Alonso. Here we see him, his achievements, his 32 victories, and his two world titles in 2005 and 2006. We can also look at his accomplishments in the form of SVG using the classes that we saw before. And with the different colors, we're able to see that in 2010, he had five wins and 10 podiums. Now let's have a deeper look into the 2010 races in which Alonso participated. Let's select all the races and let's look at the Italian Grand Prix. We can see that the podium is composed of Felipe Massa, Jensen Butler, and Fernando Alonso, who won the race. All right, let's dig into the details about the results of this race. In this list box, the colors are obtained with meta expressions and help us to read the data with very simple code. And we see easily that Sebastian Vettel gained two points for his ranking on the grid which gave him 12 points in the World Championship. Now, let's look into the race into more detail with a lap-by-lap -lap classification. When hovering over Sebastian Vetter, we see that he lost one position at the beginning of the race, but came in strong at the end. If you'd like more information on the racetrack, you can click on the circuit logo and type Monza in the search. Here you have the information about the track, and if you click on the map, you have the map from Google Maps. Let's go back to the 2010 season. We can find both the driver and the constructor of World Championship, but also in more details, which driver is working race by race. We see that this season has been very competitive, especially between five drivers. Here we see that Sebastian Vettel won right at the end with one point over Fernando Alonso. Now let's have a look at the Renault team where Fernando Alonso won his two titles. Here you can find information about the team and you can also find statistics about every driver during their time at Renault. To create all these screens, we used 4D and the framework provided by this world tour. Now we'd like to show you how you can create a new form in the form editor. So now we will create a form called My Table. And we will choose a macro called Create a Panel from Zero. And I want, for example, two rows in the first column and three rows in the second. And yes, I want tabs. Now, this is how I create a form very quickly. We can also use macros to control form objects. For example, I want text in a form that is not associated with an XLIF. Select the none XLIF text macro. This shows that legend circuit is not associated with an XLIF. And if I look at its properties, we can see that it is not connected to an XLIF. The framework is a great tool that allows you to quickly start visualizing your data so that you can focus on your data at hand. Oh, wow. Pretty impressive, I think. This, to me, is the idea and the power of 4D, starting with some data and an idea and build, building a really cool application. So there we have it. The technical presentation of the World Tour is completed. I hope you enjoyed this review of a complex application and I really invite you to look at the code yourselves to learn from what the, all, the, the whole team has done. So thank you for your attention. I'm now passing to Sarah to conclude today's event. Thank you, Ahlam, and thank you, Basma, for your presentation. And thank you, everyone, for attending. So we hope you enjoyed the free live session as much as we did. If you want to go into more details to learn more about 4D, uh, V19 capabilities and get hands-on experience, join us for the 4D World Tour Live training. And you can find the link on the chat box. So we'll be launching soon a web portal where you can be able to schedule you to schedule the training by choosing the date that suits your calendar the best for each of the six trainings.
And once you leave this session, you will receive a survey prompt. So please take the time to give your feedback and help us improve our virtual event. It takes less than two minutes to fill out the form. And you can also find the link in the chat box right now. So for the framework and the recording, we will be sending it to you in the thank you email. And as always, you can use the forum to leave questions after the session. Before closing this free live session, uh, Yolen or any of the other panelists, uh, panelists, do you have any parting words? Uh, yes, to conclude this uh, session, I'd like to say uh, thank you to all the 40 experts. I'd like to say thank you to Sarah, Alham, Sarah and Eric for bringing live to this live session today and all the rest of the 40 experts who spent a lot of energy, enthusiasm and um, time, they worked days and nights, literally, to make this event possible. And I'd like to thank you, finally, all of you uh, members of the community, the 40 community, all of you who connected today to this live session. We're looking forward to see you again uh, for the trainings. And uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to register or to contact us. And uh, the very last word, please, Please take care and most of all, stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Bye. Bye.